Well, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever time zone you're in. Um, welcome to this webinar about uh, making use of date times with uh, FME. Uh, my name's Mark Island and I'll be a presenter today. Uh, I'm the FME evangelist at SAFE, if you've uh, not met me before. And with me is my Colin Kalin. Do you want to say hi, Kalin? Hi, I'm Kalin and I'm an FME desktop expert as well. <laughs> and with us as well is uh, Stephanie. Hello. Um, I'm going to be helping out on Q&A behind the scenes. And we have a couple different places for Q&A, actually. So as we go, please type in your questions to Mark and Kaylin, and we'll try and answer as many as we can. Um, and then a special shout out to Kaylin. I know you've done a couple webinars before, but this is kind of your first, like, co-hosty one that you're doing solo here with Mark. So, yay, Kaylin. <laughs> Thanks. It's, it's going to be great, yes. It and is. we're all in, we're all in different time zones as well, the three of us. So uh, that uh, adds a little bit of relevance to the uh, the, to the topic, I guess. Kind of fun. Yeah. It is. Totally matches the theme. I'm here in Vancouver. Um, I'm, I'm in Manitoba. And I'm in Ontario. Yeah. We're all just a few hours apart, so. This is yeah. kind of fun. Okay, with that, I, so, we can probably turn off our webcams and get started sure. here. Um, Absolutely. That's but yeah, cool. pepper in your questions as we go. I'll be there helping out behind the scenes. Okay, well, um, let's uh, move on to the next uh, slide, shall we? So we, today we're talking about dates and times. And to me, I think date time information can make your data, well, incredibly valuable, it says on screen. Um, and that's true. Uh, I think a lot of our users don't necessarily make as full a use of uh, date times as perhaps they could because they're not aware of the functionality that FME offers. Um, and there are there's so many different ways in which we can process this data and we can analyze them in different ways as well and use them in different reports and different analysis. And yeah, as it says on the side, it's time to stop wasting time. It's time to stop wasting our date times. And, make use of them. So that's all well, but date times can be very complicated. Um, there are multiple structures. Uh, every format seems to have its own structure. We've heard that story before. And once you start looking at date time arithmetic, that's difficult. What's one date minus the other date and comparing dates? And how do you handle the time zones and the leap years and the international date lines and other big one. So when you've got time data all over the world, um, that's when it becomes more complicated. And even if you are aware of the potential of your date time data, you, you might be processing it only with a lot of manual effort. So we are here to solve that problem. Uh, I think we have some examples as well. Were you going to go through these, Kaylin, or was I? I can't remember. Yeah, I can I can do it. So sure. when we were looking for content for the webinar, we were kind of amazed to see how many different ways that date times are used and how many different contexts. It was kind of interesting to see how they um, behave when transiting between applications as well. So we saw a lot of things like, can I make my dates human readable? Or can I tell if X year is a leap year? Are my dates ISO 8601 compliant? Does it matter what time zone I am in? Or does it matter what time zone my FME server is in? And why does this all matter? So we have a poll question just to see what you guys, uh, what your challenges are with, with date time. Yeah, so I guess the options here, these environmental spatial options, obstacles, sorry, that's time zones. And um, what else would you say? Anything in particular, Kaylin? Um, I'd say it definitely like application obstacles, probably the differences between like format alignment and the differences between library okay. or maybe date time fraction handling. Okay. And then mm -hmm. there's things like holidays and weekends and they can be. Yeah. Like well. societal challenges. Yeah. You all have to handle that as well. So it's all, uh, uh, they, they can be complex and maybe folk don't actually, um, <laughs> use date time so much. Anyway, we'll see. <clears throat> okay, well, it, yeah, I think we're probably uh, ready with that. Yeah, I can I'll see close the results. Oh, in one second, sorry, responses were just flying in. I think some people oh, might wow. join the <laughs> webinar late. 
So I'm going to close this down now and share the results. There's a lot of good info here. Wow, excellent. Well, I think one of the good things about that is most of them are the format alignment, and I think most of them FME should handle automatically. And if they don't, we should be fixing that, improving that pretty shortly, I hope. But, uh, but we'll talk about that anyway. So. OK. okay. <clears throat> so our mission is to help you maximize the value of your data, or in this context, your date time data. So hopefully after watching this webinar, you'll understand how date times work in FME and how they can be used as an asset in your analysis. So the basics, I'm just going to go over a date time and a date time. A date is a calendar date, a time is a clock time, optionally with a UTC offset, and then a date is a combination of both the calendar date and clock time. So interpretation. So when reading, FME will read date times and convert them to its own internal format, which is just down here in this reading box. And this is FME's standard date time format. By doing this, FME has an easier time parsing, formatting, and manipulating these kinds of values. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but I think if your dates are in the ISO format, they will not be converted to FME's internal format, but... Uh, yeah, so, so I mean, a lot of the reading depends if FME can recognize your date time structure. If you've got your own particular structure, then we can't recognize it. Then you'll have to use a transformer, but generally we will recognize it. And like Kaylin said, some of our transformers and uh, things inside FME will apart from recognizing FME's date time format, we'll work on uh, ISO format as well. So if your dates are in ISO format, w again, we can handle those directly. I think I think the development team are regretting not using ISO format as our standard and having our own, but, uh, but there we go. And just if you're not aware, the ISO standard just defines what parts of a date time should appear and in what order they should appear. Yeah. Um, so when writing, FME will likely convert date times to whatever the respective application accepts. Writers are kind of set up to work end to end without the user really having to care about the format inside. But like with everything, there are always exceptions. Mm -hmm. I just I just mentioned, Kaylin, since um, oh. so many people said the format was a uh, was their big thing, mm -hmm. I just wanted to emphasize that 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 point. Sorry to interrupt no. on your, your flow there, but. But yeah, as long as as long as a date is in the FME format, the FME structure, when it gets to the writer, if it needs to go into the a different structure for the writer, FME generally will convert that automatically. It's not like you have to do something to it. So if your date is in say ISO format in the start, we'll read it. We might convert it to a FME format in the middle, and when we write it, we will put it in the right structure. That shouldn't that's the application obstacle we talked about before. Really, the key of FME is to try and remove those obstacles and do that smoothly and automatically. So uh, I just really wanted to emphasize that because, yeah, so many people said that was the big issue for them. And Thanks. if it's not, then you use, need to use a transformer, and Kaylin is going to show that as well. Sorry, I'm, I'm butting <laughs> in, but go, go no. ahead, Kaylin. No, no the, more, the more the better. Okay, so these exceptions we commonly see with the uh, databases. So I'm sure Oracle you've heard mentioned or Snowflake. And all this means is that it's gonna require a little more ceremony when writing date times to these formats. Um, they just probably take a proprietary structure that you have to kind of accommodate. Why? Underneath, I I'm pretty sure they store data as seconds since UTC epoch, which means they store date times as a number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. I'm not totally sure why, but that's why. I, I guess yeah. so maybe it's easier to store in a just as yeah. a single number rather than but, optimized or something. Yeah, but they want to show it in a way that people can understand. So I guess that's why they they don't ask you for that as input. So anyway. Sorry. So these are <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> these are the three daytime transformers that we offer in FME. So we have the daytime converter, the daytime calculator, and stamper. The converter, like Mark said, will convert formats from one to another, date time formats from one to another. The calculator performs arithmetic either on or between date intervals. And then the timestamper just takes a timestamp of now and stores it in a new attribute. 
So understanding format string flags, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but this is just how we reference different parts of date time. Format string flags are just abbreviated expressions used to represent individual parts of a date time format. Oh, and actually this, uh, this screenshot came from the quick reference section in the date time converter, but we have an expanded uh, version in our documentation too, which I think we can link out. Yeah. I forgot to ask the development team whether those are standard flags as well as, or whether we made our own up. I think they're pretty standard ones though, so I'm not sure. I would standard. imagine, but cool to check. Yeah, I should have asked, but hey. Um, so this is the date time stamper. This is probably one of the easiest transform or date time transformers you'll use. And so on the left, I'm taking a timestamp in UTC time, and on the right, I'm taking a timestamp in local time, and I'm applying an offset. So the difference between UTC and local time UTC or coordinate universal time is a global standard based on zero longitude. And it's pretty much the time standard that regulates date times on a global scale, kind of literally like a universal clock. So I believe that it's used for the International Space Station and any other uh, kind of events that happen on a global scale like that. And unlike local time, UTC time doesn't have to be adjusted for daylight savings. So what's local time? Local time is the standard local time of where you are, and it's more or less based off the sun's location. Technically, we should call it local standard time because it's been standardized into time zones, and those time zones offset values are defined from their offset from UTC time. Okay. So, so even though, uh, so more powerful together. So when these transformers are used in conjunction with one another, not only can we take a date timestamp of now, but we can use a date time converter to make it human readable as well. So it makes it a little more digestible for the audience. <clears throat> so now we're going to jump into some advanced examples and then I'll hand it over to Mark to blow you away with some really cool examples. So the first one is a tree inspection demo, and I just created a small scenario and then I'll hop into Workbench. So here we're gonna use daytime transformers to monitor tree inspection requirements for planted trees in the Vancouver, BC area. Inspections are required every 10 years a tree is lived. Here inspections are used to report disease, infestation or damage, or maybe if it was a logging company checking for yield value or age. Okay, so I did pre-build this example um, just for the sake of time. Can everyone see Workbench? Mark, can you see Workbench? I can see Workbench. Maybe Perfect. you can zoom in slightly just so it's a bit easier to see. I'm not sure what resolution your screen is. but uh... Is this better? Yep, absolutely, yeah. Okay. So first, let's read in the data and let's identify our date time attribute. I'm just going to close this. <clears throat> So we have tree ID, address, but we can tell that planting date is going to be our date time attribute. So from here, we're going to use a date time calculator, and we're going to use the mode calculate intervals between date times, because we want to know how long the tree has been planted. So our start date is going to be the planting date, which we're going to navigate down with our drop arrows. And then we're going to want to measure pretty much up until today's date. We're looking for 10 years a tree has been planted, so the result type is going to be in years, and we're going to store this variable in total years planted. Before you click OK, Kaylin, can you? Oh, yeah. sorry. Can no, you show I haven't. Me, there's other options on there um, to get the result type. So yeah, you can get an ISO standard duration as well, which is like will tell you like it's like P, the number Y which is like the number of years, number of months, days, hours, seconds, minutes, if you want. It's all oh, in so one string. Like countdown. Yeah. Yeah, Just because cool. I yeah. did my conditional values with the year value, mm -hmm. I don't know how it's going to handle the fractions. We'll keep going, yep. but that's cool. Um, and so as we can see, we just have our calculated total years. I'm going to clean this up with an attribute rounder. And you don't have to do that, that's totally up to you. And then the next few steps, I'm just creating an empty attribute to hold a, a simple yes or no, is the inspection required? An attribute manager is being used to test for conditional values. So is the tree implanted for more than 10 years, yes or no? And then this is just testing for action. So 
obviously there's a lot of trees to be inspected, but I didn't finish this example. We could write it to a AGLE or ArcGIS Online feature service, or maybe we could write it to a report and have this emailed out um, to our tree inspectors. But um, that is the first demo. Yeah, that's okay. a good one. Thanks. And you could have used a date time stamper there, I guess, but I, instead, yeah. in, instead you put a function into the uh, date time calculator. And we'll look at that shortly. I just wanted to uh, mention that. Yeah, you talk about functions. Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is the next example. It kind of does the same arithmetic as the first one, so I'm not gonna be in Workbench for this one. I'm just gonna talk it through very briefly. So we're reading a CSV with two birth dates. We're using the attribute uh, manager to use the date time function, which Mark just mentioned to get the date time now. We're using the date time converter to align the formats. And then we're calculating again here between intervals and we're just getting the result in our attribute manager. So those are the results. So yeah, these, we, now oh, we know who's older. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was gonna be you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it is, isn't it? <laughs> we need uh, to have... Anyway, yeah. so I was going to say we need to have calculators like, could I be old enough to be your father? Could I be old enough to be your <laughs> grandfather? I'm like, we'd have to calculate that, but it's on the edge. That can be a <laughs> webinar 2.0. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, so my last example is uh, just being able to tell if something is a leap year or not. I thought this is kind of a cool example because we can use the user parameter manager window, which is a new feature in 2021.0. And so I'm going to jump into a workspace with this user parameter already built and then just build out the workspace. But I wanted to identify this here that I'm actually not using the date time option, although some people might be inclined to think that. I'm just using the number option so we can control the user's input. So it actually lets me sit, set set lower and upper limits. Um, but yeah, I thought I should identify that. And I'm gonna pull up Workbench. <clears throat> so just to show you, I have this already created. And then from here, what we're gonna do is test for a leap year. So we're gonna add an attribute manager and create two dates. And typically there's 365 days in a year. So we're gonna have start date and end date. Whoa. And so if a leap year, uh, sorry, if a year is a leap year, it means that it has 366 days. And so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna subtract two uh, values and see if we have one day left or two days left remaining in the year. So we're going to subtract, oops, sorry, um, pretty much from February 28th to March 31st. So, or sorry, oh, not 31st, the first. <laughs> and we can run, actually, we will wait to run. And date time calculator. And we're going to calculate interval between dates again, start date, end date. And we're gonna look for the days because we wanna know if there's two or one days. We wanna see if there's 365 or 66. So I know that 2024 is a leap year, but we can test with both values. And so we have the result of two, so that's 366 days. Now, if I wanted to create a tester, we could add this in and have this kind of a little more manual, or sorry, just done automatically for us. So two, and then if it passed, it's a leap year. And if it doesn't, it's not. So we can try this example again. Um, with 23 and see if it works which I don't think it should. Awesome, so 2023 is not a leap year. Okay, and I think that concludes the advanced Fantastic. example. Could you just go back to that workspace a second, Kelly? Absolutely. Look at the tester transformer. Um, 
There was something I just wanted to uh, highlight there. Here we go, sure. In, in the tester, yeah. So when you look down, there's a comparison mode. And if you mm -hmm. click on that, one of the options is date time. So the tester will actually test specifically dates and times. You can say, does this date equal that date or is it greater than that date? Um, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. It's, I uh, that. Yeah, it's nice how they built that into the, uh, the tester because that's one of the things we really want to do sometimes is compare one date to another. And um, yeah, that's... Uh, that's one way you can do that. So yeah, date times are built into a lot of transformers, not just the um, not just the three main uh, date time transformers that you show. Yeah, that's a good point too. Yeah. Um, so Q and A. We, does anyone have any questions? There were some questions. Can I read out a couple of uh, things there? Sure. Um, Let's see, I've got to find what the questions were. Somebody asked if using the date time stamper, it generates a date time with the seconds having decimal places. Can we get rid of them with the date time converter? I don't think you can, not with the date time converter. I think you would have to use the uh, attribute rounder as Kaylin did, or you could use an int function as I'm going to do shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, I've asked the developers if they can create uh, a flag or something to say, I don't want uh, fractions of a second, I only want integers, but I don't think we've got that yet. So um, if you want to post that on uh, the FME community as an idea, then other people can upvote it and uh, that, would be, uh, that would be useful. Mm -hmm. uh, someone else was asking about um, finding the format as a parameter in the reader. And I believe that uh, that is certainly happening uh, with CSV, for example, in 2021.1, which released um, yesterday um, or the day before. I can't remember now. But there's an option in there to, to define what the, uh, the, the date time format is and to say this is a date time field. Um, I think one of the things that for me has not been great at in the past has been recording the data type of fields when we read them. So we read everything and we just read it as a string and inside FME it's just treated as a string and we write it correctly on the output, but inside FME it's, we've not really had any way to tell what the attribute data type is. But now I think we're working very hard to uh, improve on that. And so in the future, yeah, we'll recognize state fields directly on the input and, um, and we will try and recognize those and try and convert them automatically and give you the option to uh, to specify what is a, uh, a date on formats like CSV where there's no schema on that. So you have to tell us what it is. But other formats have a schema that has a date time field. So we'll, we'll know about that automatically. So uh, yeah, that's going to vary. Um, Let's see. <laughs> wow, there's a question. How do you filter between date format when the Windows date format is different from an iOS date format in the JSON when a webhook and API is involved? <laughs> well, that that's gets very specific. Um, <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I mean, generally, uh, when we read, I guess when you read from an API, that's going to be an ISO format because that's your standard. Well, it's certainly standard in XML. I don't know about JSON, probably the same, I would think. Um, do you know offhand what the date time format is in JSON, Caitlin? Uh, no, I think you're right about the XML one, though. I don't know about JSON. Yeah, so it will be an ISO standard date and uh, you've got your Windows date. I mean, basically, you can convert both of those into FME internal date time structure using the date time converter transformer. Um, but it's very possible that if the Windows date time format was an FME format and the other one was an ISO format, some transformers will recognize that automatically. Um, 
I'm not sure which ones, to be honest. Uh, I didn't ask our developers, but there are transformers that will handle both. So I would hope it would work. And if it doesn't, we're, we're certainly working on that. But you could always, again, convert it into the same structure, same ISO structure or the same FME structure. And uh, yeah, that will be a way to do that. Um, yeah, and then someone else, wow, we've got a lot of questions coming in. So <laughs> obviously we're, uh, we're touching a chord with this uh, date times. Um, yeah, okay, so if reading dates from a string field as occasional malformed date or type, can FME handle that? Um, probably not. It would probably be rejected because somebody else asked what happens to null values. If we had a null input into the um, date time converter or calculator, what would happen? It would be output through the rejected port, and I suspect. Mm -hmm. well-formed values would be handled the same way. Um, we would say that we, we don't know what that is. We can't do that. Um, yeah. um, what are the thoughts on offering a days, hours, minutes result from the date time calculator? Um, yeah, so the difference between two timestamps could be one day, 13 hours, 42 minutes, 15 seconds. Yeah, so that's what you would use the ISO one for. So you would, if you calculated the difference between two dates and it was one day, 13 hours, 42 minutes, 15 seconds, then the result will be P, 1D, T, 13H, 42M, 15S. And that would be the, the result and it would all be in that one string. Um, if you wanted to split it up separately, um, you could, that, that will be a case, I think, where we would need to create a uh, custom transformer on the FME hub. Um, there's one on there, we'll talk about this later, that's got a date time exploder, which will take a date and time and explode it into its separate components. But I don't think there's one that will do that for the ISO uh, period uh, one. So uh, anyway, that's um, that's something that that exists, but you might have a little bit of work to do depending on what you want. To exactly get out of that. Um, can we show an example of how to convert a Julian format to a regular date time? For example, the date is recorded as a as a number in the database, and we are probably converting them to a readable date. So I think in that case, um, that will be the date time converter. Um, and again, maybe when I Maybe when I take over the demos, we can I can try and try that out and show an example and see whether that doesn't work. But generally, yes, date time converter, you set the input as being the, the Julian date and um, and say say an FME output and it should should work, I would hope. Hey Mark, I'm just kind of watching the clock. I'm gonna go ahead and make yes. you the presenter. Yes, and I, was just, we do I was just thinking the same, yes. We do have the Q&A at the end as well, so please do continue to send in your questions and we can always even do a bit of overtime if we have to. Um, but so many great questions coming in. Thank you all for that. There are. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. We also called in some backup support with Andrea on the line to help answer some of these questions as well. So do continue sending them in. Oh, we did. Fantastic. Okay. So where are we? We did demos. I've got to find where we are. Date time functions. Okay. So I'm just going to present quickly on date time functions. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about those. So what are FME? Let's look at FME functions in general. FME functions are tools that carry out specific tasks. Um, they're often equivalent to a standard transformer. So where we've got a transformer uh, like the area calculator calculates the area of a polygon. We'd also have an FME function that uses that that can calculate the area as well. And basically, the, off, very often the transformer is based on the function. So it, it's like a lower level of transformer, if you like. Um, what can you do with these functions? Well, you can use them inside expressions. You can use them inside all sorts of uh, transformer parameters as well. So there's lots of places we can use these functions. Why do we do that? 
when you've well when you've got already got the transformer, you don't need to do this, but many people do because it reduces workspace clutter. Instead of having a, like five or six transformers to do something, you can put everything all inside a single transformer. And it makes it more condensed. It's maybe a little less readable. Somebody else could look at it and it would be harder for them to work out what was happening. But you're saving a lot of real estate on the FME canvas. And here are some examples. So like I mentioned, there's an FME feature function called area, which measures area. There's string functions. There are math functions. But importantly for us today, there are date time functions as well. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And in particular, I'm going to look at a demonstration now, which um, we're going to set up a field in a workspace to write the last updated date. And we're going to use multiple FME functions. And we're going to get a timestamp in the correct format with the time zone set. So let me switch over to Workbench. And I was, let's see, I got to find where we are. Date time webinar, date time functions. Let's start with the beginning workspace. So I've got this workspace here, and I'm just going to zoom in a little bit just to give you a bit of better view. So we're reading from a data set and we're writing to a different data set. And you'll notice the one on the output has uh, an area field added and a, a last update field added. Um, and if we look at the user attributes, we can see that the park area is set to a, a real number and the last update is set to a date time. And What's the attribute manager doing? Well, the attribute manager so far is calculating the area with the area function in here. So we could have used an area calculator transformer, but we've put the function directly into there. Um, so how could I set the last update date? Well, I could just put a date time stamper in there. And I could say calculate that and write it out to last update. And there we go, and that would work fine. So for the basics, yeah, that's great. But what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add that into the attribute manager. And I'm going to say, let's create a new attribute called last update. Well, it even prompts me, is that the one I want? Yes, it is. I'm gonna open up the text editor dialog. And you can see on the left-hand side, we've got math functions, string functions, the FME feature functions like the area, calculation and at the bottom of there we've got date time functions and the one what I want to do is I want to get the date time now with the date time stamper equivalent and there's a date time now function but I also want to format that so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the date time format first so I'm just going to double click on the date time format function why am I doing it first well because then it automatically highlights the date time part and now I just double click date time now, and that's plugged in. So, okay, so we're taking the date time right now, we're formatting it, and now I can put the format that I want. So let me see, what am I gonna do? I think we're gonna go with percent A, percent B, percent D. See, this, this is something you, you need to know these flags if you're going to try and use them inside functions. But one of the other things you can do is look into the help. And there's a help window down there and it says, tell me about date time functions. And that'll pop up. And here we go. It tells us all about the date time functions and what they do and what the different flags are as well. So the help is always there, whether you're doing functions or whether you're in a transformer. So I'm just writing these down because I know what these are. Uh, and the way I'm sort of glancing to the side occasionally should tell you that I'm looking at it off screen. So yeah, so percent A and percent B, it's like the weekday, the day of the week, the, the month, the year, at, instead of H, I'm using I, which I guess is a 12 hour clock instead of 24. 
And again, this is all possible in transformers. I could have used the date time stamper and the date time formatter. I'm just deciding to put them all into here. Now, somebody was asking earlier about what, how do I get rid of uh, fractional seconds? How do I get rid of the fraction in the seconds? Well, there isn't uh, an option that I know of in the formatter or the date time now function, but there is a math function called int, which I can use just to turn it into an integer or round if I wanted to round it off. Um, so I'm going to use the integer function. Now the question is, where should that integer function go in here? And the first time I tried this, I made a mistake and said, I'm going to put it into, I'm going to put it around here, around the seconds part, because that's what I want to make as an integer. But that's really not where it should go because that's just the flag. What I really want to do is make the date time that's returned an integer. So I'm going to put this around the date time now function. So in other words, return the date time right now as an integer, then convert it into that format. Um, okay. And and so why would we use these again when we've got transformers? Again, I can condense everything down into that single string. I don't have to use three or four transformers to get that result. So now I can run that workspace and I can just check here and we see that we have the last update, blah, blah, blah. And in fact, I'm writing that as a date time field, which is probably wrong because XML is, that's not an ISO standard there. Um, I would probably turn that into a string um, just because, um, just because Thursday, July 8th, 2021 at 1037 is not a, a valid ISO date. But if I, if I did, have an FME standard date time, and I said write it to an ISO date time, it would be fine with that. So maybe what I could do just to prove that is I could change that to a string, well, character, not a string. Let's go 64 characters, and we can do last update ISO, and that will be a date time. And I'm just going to throw a date time stamper down here just to show that this is working. There we go. So if I run that now, we should see that we get a date time in the FME format still. It's still 2021, 07, 08, blah, blah, blah. But when we look at the output, we should find that that's in the ISO standard, uh, or it might be in the output, it might be an ISO standard, it might be FME, um, <laughs> because we're reading it back with FME, FME is probably converting it back into an FME structure, but in the GML itself, I would hope that it is written in uh, ISO standard. So anyway, that's how uh, that works. Okay, so we have those functions there. Let's see, what am I going on to next? The next thing we're going to look at is the time windower. And the time windower is not really one of the, the core date time transformers, but it's a, a different one, a different way of handling dates and times. Um, it groups features together based on a date time um, and it sort of creates windows so you say okay I'd like to split my data up into one hour periods or five minute periods or something like that and originally we did this to help read real-time data streams and that's really what predominantly what it's for but we can also use it for processing features in groups outside of a stream um, the, the, the thing is, it, it sometimes requires a bit of a careful setup, especially when you're live streaming data, because you want to make sure that the, the workspace is passing the information correctly uh, and at the right place at the right time. So it does take a bit of setup for that scenario, but uh, we'll have a quick look at that as well. So I've got two scenarios here. One of them is we're going to update a weather forecast every 15 minutes 
based on live wind speed data. So we're going to say, hey, we're at an airport. Every 15 minutes, we have to give a new wind speed um, information, but we've got wind speed coming from the uh, the sensor outside every few seconds. So how are we going to do that? And then the other one I'm going to do is not as live stream of data. It's going to be a, a data set of parking tickets and say, well, how are we going to group this into, say, seven day intervals? So let's have a look at that. So where are we? Day, time window. Here we go. So I've got two examples in here. And the first one is the streaming example. And I just made this up. So we're not going to be able to run this. But it, this is how it would look in your workspace. So we're kicking the workspace off by just hitting a create a transformer. And that just says start the workspace. This transformer is an MQTT connector. Basically, that's a message uh, handling uh, service online. And it's sending, it can send records to a workspace and the workspace will keep running and keep receiving those records uh, in real time. And I just made this up completely. I don't have a URL to, to run with, um, but that's how it would work. And other formats are, are supported as well. It's like a TCP IP connector, a receiver and sender. So quite often anything that's called a something receiver will be waiting for things to come. So you can say, oh, a WebSocket receiver. We're, we're sending data from a sensor via WebSockets. We can listen on that WebSocket and we can pull the data in in a real time stream. So I've got a stream of data coming in as messages, but I don't want to output new wind speed information every time I get a sensor reading. I want to take that 15 minute period and calculate the average. So how do I do that? How do I say, we'll wait for 15 minutes and then do this. Well, what we've got here is a time window a transformer. And the time window says, okay, well, the setting is every 15 minutes. As soon as the workspace starts, start counting, well, 15 minutes are up, then tag all the features that have come in with window number one and pass that on to the next transformer. And at the same time, when all the other data that's coming in, after that 15 minutes, I'm holding it there and saying, okay, this data gets held, this is going to be window number two, and we'll pass it on when the next 15 minutes is up. And it could be 15 minutes, 15 seconds, 15 days, whatever I want. Um, so yeah, so I run that every 15 minutes, it outputs that data, and it sends it to the statistics calculator. And the statistics calculator, this is where one of the reasons we have to be a little bit careful in this scenario, we say group by the window ID. So in other words, every record that has the same window ID, find out the average value of the wind speed and find out the maximum value of the wind speed. So everything that comes in the first 15 minute window, do this calculation, send the data out. The next window comes in, do that and send it out. Normally, a, a group by transformer doesn't do that. Normally, it holds the data as long as it can, waiting just in case there's more information for the group. So it's important to set the group by mode to say, whenever the group changes, spit the records out. So in other words, as soon as we get the next record from window two, we're obviously done. So window one can go out and that can be our latest info. So that's what the time window is doing. It's basically creating little windows little periods of time and tagging the data with it. And the one example I can run is this one here. So what are we doing here? Well, I'm reading some parking ticket data and the parking ticket data has got a date on it. And so I'm reading that date and converting it to an FME format because right now the, the date is in the structure month, day, year with a slash between it. So I've gone into there and I've manually defined the input format. Um, we can pick a, a known format from the list, but if I don't know the input format or I know it doesn't match one of those, I can just type it into the field directly. So I've said, okay, it's coming in in this format, output it to me in an FME format, sort the data into date order. And that's one of the great things about using the, uh, the FME date time format is it's sortable uh, whereas I don't think the ISO 
standard would work quite the same way. So we can sort the date into, because it's a numeric value, we can sort it that way. And then the time window says, okay, instead of creating a timestamp like the previous example did, you've already got a timestamp, so I'm going to use that to divide the data up. And we're saying every seven days worth of data, output it to a new window. So it's not like it's waiting seven days as the above time window does, because the above time window is saying, okay, I'm going to have to timestamp this. The, uh, this time window says, oh, you've already got a timestamp. I'm going to use that. So we can see from my source data, the date was 2nd of the 1st, 2016. We convert it to an FME structure. We sort that into there and we output with a time window. And so what we should find is, okay, we start counting at zero, not one. So window number zero is the first week of the year and somewhere around the 7th or the 8th of the month, it should change. Uh, let's see. Okay, we're on the 8th. I'm just scrolling back up. Wow, there were a lot of parking tickets on the 8th. There we go. So the 7th of the month is window 0. The 8th of the month is window 1. And that way, we can basically split our data up and at that point, I could do all sorts of things. Like again, I could calculate statistics and do a group by, or I could do a fan out and write it to different sheets on a spreadsheet according to the time window and so on. Now, if, you, if you're looking at this, you might say, oh, well, couldn't I just do that by calculating the week of the year using the date time converter? I could just say, well, tell me, tell me what week of the year it is. Um, there's a way of doing that. A week of the year, percentage W. Couldn't I just get the same thing using percentage W? And yes, okay, I could do that. But the idea of the time window here is I could change this. So if I could say, actually, I only want every five days, or I want every uh, 24 hours, I want a new window. And so that's how we can, uh, that, that's where the flexibility comes in of the time window. So yeah, so that's what the time window does. Um, what are we going to look at next? Well, this is my final demo for today, and we're going to look at some FME hub transformers, and we're going to use them, and we're going to use what we've done so far, and we're going to put everything all together um, and give a sort of final result. So what is the hub? Well, the hub, if you're not aware of it, is a website that we have where we can store transformers, formats, and tools like coordinate systems and the like. And basically, you can use those to extend the, your capabilities of your FME. Um, and we, at Safe Software, we put things on the hub for you to use, but other users can put their own things on there as well. So you can create your own transformer and put it onto the hub. And then you can just use it inside a workspace however you like. And that's the demo we're going to do right now. We're going to calculate the landing time of an aircraft in the local time of landing given the local time of departure and the flight time. So let's have a look at that. And again, it's a pre-made uh, workspace, um, but I'm, I'm just going to show it to you rather than put it together just because it's a bit quicker. So what have we got here? Well, we've got, I'm creating a point that's in Los Angeles airport. I'm creating a point that's in Sydney airport. And you'll see we've got these time zone extractor transformers. Well, what are they? Well, they came from the FME hub. If I flip back to my web uh, page, I can go to the FME hub and basically I can look at this and say, oh, look, here's, here are all these different transformers that are available, like natural language processing. There's an advanced sampler there uh, and, and so on. But if I do a search, like if I type for date, I find a whole bunch of date related ones like relative date calculator. So what, how many days is it till last Thursday would be a relative date. Um, there's a working days calculator, I know that. Uh, there's a date time exploder, I think I mentioned that. It takes a date time and splits it up into its individual parts. 
uh, previous Saturday calculator, the, the next Monday calculator, um, working days calculator, that's, that's one that I did, um, tells you the difference between two dates in the number of working days. Um, there's even one on here, and this is this is me because I have a bit of obsessions about date times. Sundial calculator. Hey, you want to create a sundial? You can do that with this transformer. It'll calculate it and it'll calculate a template that you can print out and create a sundial from. So, so yes, yeah, so this is the hub. There's lots of things on there. And one of the things is this time zone extractor, which says I can take a point in the world and pick out what time zone it's in. So that's what I'm going to do here. So I'm picking out Los Angeles and I'm picking out Sydney and Australia and I'm finding what the time zone they're in. So Los Angeles is in the Pacific daytime, daylight savings time. It's minus 28,800 seconds from UTC. So eight hours behind. But you can see there's a daytime offset of 3,600 seconds, i.e. one hour, because we're in summertime. And we get the same thing with Sydney. That's 3,600 seconds in front, so 12 hours, I guess. And there's no daylight savings times offset because they're not in daylight savings time. So I've got those two positions. I've created a line between them. What am I going to do now? I'm going to calculate uh, if a flight took off from Sydney at a certain, from uh, LA at a certain time, what time would it land in Sydney? So I've got some published parameters, actually. If I turn on the prompt and hit the run button, have I got user parameters? Yeah, I should be prompting there. Let's do rerun, there we go. So I can pick what time it takes off, like 11 o'clock on the 3rd of June. It takes 15 hours and two minutes to fly. What time will it land in Sydney? So we're saying, take the local date time, add the journey length to it in hours and minutes, that's the time it'll land in Sydney in Los Angeles time. Now we need to convert that to Sydney time. And this is where I use functions because the date time uh, functions for time zones, you can only use inside a function. There's no transformer to do that. So I say, set the time zone, take the landing time as it is in the LA time, and convert it to the next time zone on our list, which was Sydney time. So now I can look at the output from there and say, okay, the, the let's see, destination landing time is, and it will tell me that there. And all I'm doing with this last few bits is making it more readable to the human eye. So we say, well, let's break it so I can actually understand that without trying to figure out the numbers. And it'll tell us the destination landing time. 5th of June at 7.02 a.m. And the orthodrome replacer, that's another hub transformer um, that replaces a line between two points with a, uh, an orthodrome, basically the, the uh, uh, what do we call it? It's not a great circle route, or it sort of is a great circle route. It's the shortest line between those points. And then I just write it out to a HTML report, which I can have a quick look at. And this is it. So we say, hey, I wrote it out. We're flying from Los Angeles to Sydney. If we took off from LA on the 3rd of June, 2021 at 11 o'clock at night, and it took 14 hours, three minutes, then you would land at the 5th of June, 7.02. Why is it two days later? Well, one of the reasons is because it's gone over the midnight period from 11 o'clock at night to seven in the morning. That's midnight period. So that's one reason. But the other reason is it's passed over the date timeline as well. And again, FME could figure out that difference. It, it knew the date time line was there, the international date line, and it knew the difference between midnight and the day after, and it calculated it as being that time of landing. And we can confirm that works because I can look things up on uh, like FlightAware, which this is how I tested it. I said, oh, well, I wonder what, if this will work. So I take the takeoff time in LA, the landing time in Sydney, take the uh, the total traveling time, run that through, and we get the same landing time as they get. So I know it's working correctly. That's cool. Yeah. 
Oh, excuse me, I'm, my mouth's getting dry. I know we're running short of time, but I'll just mention um, I did uh, create a an app that you can use if you felt like using it. And maybe I'll just chat that link out if I can find the chat link. So I turned that into a server workspace, put it onto server, made it an app. And if you follow that link, you will get to this page and you can you can try this out. You can pick a place on the map. You can pick a landing place on the map. You can say how long it would take to fly between the two and hit OK, and it will tell you what the landing time is. So there you go. Right, yes, we should probably get back to the um, presentation because we're really running out of time. There's not a lot left. We've, we've done all the demos now. Um, really, the whole point of this was to show how you can increase the value of your data by using date times and by showing the different things that you can do in FME, how you can handle the time zones with the time zone functions, how FME will automatically handle certain things. One of the keys to handling the date times is as long as you've got the UTC offset set on your times, FME can calculate the difference between them and it will take that into account. So that's really uh, one way of doing that. It's, it's, it's really useful. And yeah, you can add so much value to date times by doing arithmetic, doing conversions of the structure, all sorts of things. Uh, and FME can certainly help you there. There was one other thing I think you wanted to talk about this, Kaylin. Um, yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting when I stumbled upon it. Um, mm -hmm. So just because of continental drift, so continental drift, the speed that this is happening, Google told me it was about 2.5 centimeters a year. But due to the drift of the continents, there's a growing shift between different coordinate systems. So now they're starting to kind of consider time as an aspect in coordinate systems. So it might be like X, Y, Z, T. Um, yeah. But that'd be kind of cool to know. Yeah, I think uh, in Australia especially, they've got the Good Day 2020. Um, yeah, GDA. Uh, GDA, yeah, I think they pronounce it well. Yeah, you think GDA 2020, <laughs> and then you realize, oh, it's a good day. <laughs> good day. Might, yeah, I think they might have done that on purpose. But um, anyway, <laughs> yes, because Australia is drifting, I think, a lot faster than other people, other countries. And so they figured they needed to do something. And I think the 2020 was the baseline. And from now on, basically, you don't need to record just where something is, but you need to say when it is. And then there's the proj library, which should be able to convert and take the Earth's surface motion into account as well. And uh, FME does support the proj library. It's got a proj reprojector uh, transformer. Uh, I haven't tried it using the, the dates and the times as well, but I'm hoping it would work. Um, yeah. Kind of curious to see how that'll work. Actually. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. I, I I think it's going to be important. One of the things, one of the big examples I read somewhere was somebody trying to build a bridge between two oil rigs, I think, and they'd surveyed the positions of the rigs in 1970. And of course, the Earth's surface had moved them apart slightly since then. And so even though, though the coordinates were correct, the, the Earth had moved, so the things had moved. The bridge yeah, I bit and, um, heard another example like that about a logging com uh, company, and I guess they yeah. clear cut into like a park, <laughs> a few kilometers Ooh. into a park. Yeah, it was pretty, Yikes. pretty iffy yeah. example, but it's yeah. funny. Yikes. Anyway, um, again, thank you for um, for coming to this uh, this webinar today. Uh, it's really fun to show off dates and times. It's that, just a little bit different to the spatial and uh, I really enjoy talking about that. Um, so I hope it was useful for you today. Um, and yeah, if you've not used FME before, you can certainly use it, download it and give it a try, safe.com slash trial. You can connect with us on all sorts of social media, at Safe Software on Twitter, and I'm at FME Evangelist on Twitter. Um, yeah. Um, did you want to say anything to wrap up, uh, Stephanie or uh, Kaylin? And somebody mentioned, yeah, it's plate tectonics, not continental drift, but yeah. 
Oh, thanks for correcting us. Yeah, that's why I, I got an E in geophysics at university. And so I didn't <laughs> didn't follow up on that. And that's that's why. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yes. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, anything you. from you, Stephanie, before we? Uh... No, that looks great. I think there looked like there was maybe a couple other questions that came in. So we could um, yeah. stick around maybe for another five minutes for Q&A. But if anyone has to leave, thank you so much for attending. We hope this was helpful. And if you have questions as you're like going away and applying some of what you learned, you can reach us on live chat at safe.com or in the FME community, which is probably um, the best bet to try first is uh, going there and seeing what resources are available. So I'll just chat out the link to that. Um, but yeah, so I saw, there was one question I saw that came in um, that was asking the difference between the transformers in the hub and kind of like the regular transformers right. in FME. That's a fantastic question. Yeah. So the hub transformers, if I go to the hub again. So the hub transformers, they get there's like three different categories. One of them is official ones, like safe software official transformers and the natural language processing one is one of those and i think the twitter transformer might be one of those now i don't maybe not but basically fme safe software started putting fme transformers on the hub because if they call an api and the api changes we don't want you to have to reinstall fme completely to get that new capability like with Twitter, Twitter changed their API and suddenly it didn't work for anybody in FME. And we made a fix, but you had to download and install the latest FME. And that was a, a bit of a pain just for one transformer. So what we do now is we put official packages on the website for certain, certain formats like Amazon S3. And so if Amazon changed the S3 API and we had to make changes in FME to match, you could just re-download that package and it would work fine. So that's one category, official things from Safe Software. They're just as good as any transformer that's in FME itself. And the other side of things is the community. And community, there's several um, sort of types of that. One of them is uh, community members just submitting things like, um, let's see. So somebody here created an AGOL um, transformer to pull job usage stats from a ArcGIS online data store um, and so yeah so you can try that it depends how much you trust the user uh, you would want to probably make sure it's working it won't be tested by as it's safe uh, so you want to make sure it uh, it really does do what it says and there, there'll be no support from us for um, a transformer like that but then there's also a couple of things here, like Safe Lab, you'll notice is one, and that's sort of a semi-official one. Most of the ones I put are this Safe Lab, like this inclusive sampler is one of mine. And basically it's sort of, we've made it, we've put a lot of effort into it, it should work. It's not an official transformer, but we sort of guarantee it really does quite a good job. So those are the different types of hub transformers that are available. So uh, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah. And then there was a question as well asking whether or not we were able to share any of the workspaces shown here today. Absolutely, yes. Of course. Not, not a problem. Yeah. Excellent. So yes, what usually happens there is after the webinar, we'll go and package up um, the recording, the slides, and the workspaces and we will email all those out to everyone who registered so do check your email for that and if for whatever reason you don't get it all our webinars are uploaded to safe.com webinars and you can find all the materials there yeah someone was asking um, about if they were really great circles as created or, or not um terminology is like they, they call them orthodromes in here, and I'm not sure why or what the difference is between an orthodrome and a loxodrome and a, uh, a 
what's the other line that there is? Is, is a great, so an orthodrome is a great circle. I guess a loxodrome is the what's the other line called? Uh, I can't remember. But the arc of a great circle is another sort of line as well. Rum line. That's what I'm trying to think of. Is that rum line? Yes, rum line. So yeah, there's different things there that it could be producing, but I think it's producing great circles. It says so. Nice. Were there any um, other questions that you saw, Stephanie? I or? saw this one. It's not directly related to this webinar, but we might have some resources we can send them to. Mm -hmm. um, someone was asking, like, how would someone go about creating their own transformer? And is that's, that... Uh, yeah, that's, that was... <laughs> that's a great... I, I can do a very quick example here if, uh, if you want to bear with me. Um, nice. That'd be cool. So... This is my standard example that I show. So I'm reading some data from a parks data set. And if anyone's taken training or the training from a few years ago, at least, they'll, they'll recognize uh, this uh, workspace. So I've got some parks. I want to find the average area of each park. So I put an area calculator transformer down. And then I put a statistics transform calculator transformer down. And I say, let's calculate the statistics on the area and find the mean value for that. So that's what I'm doing there. And then I'm just sending that data out um, to somewhere else. And I say, oh, well, actually, calculating the average area, that sounds like a really good idea for a custom transformer. Uh, why don't I create one of those? And then the next time I need to do this, I can just put that transformer down directly. So all I do in here is do control T or right click and create custom transformer. And I'm gonna give it a name. So I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna give it marks demo here. I can give it a category. I can enter some description about it. And basically I click okay and it sets this up. And there we go. That's my custom transformer created just like that. Um, and it's still embedded inside my workspace here. But what I can do is I can click File, Export the Custom Transformer. Uh, it'll export that to a file. And it just takes a second. And it opens up in another window. There we go. So now I've got what we call an FMX file. And it is... I can grab there we go marks demo.fmx so that's my transformer now and it basically i could go to the hub and log in and upload this and say hey i've got a custom transformer here that calculates the average area of polygons and people could use that uh, for for doing that yeah that's awesome so yeah very quick uh demo there and all yeah. the all the all the transformers that are on the hub, you can add them to your workspace just by typing their name in here. So if I type in, I think I've got an average area calculator on the hub and it comes up and says, oh, look, this is the hub transformer. Do you want to download it? And I say, yes, please. And it'll download it and it's because I've already created one with the same name. It doesn't like that, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Super cool. I didn't actually realize it was that fast. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's really easy um, to do once you've got something. It's uh, very quick. Super cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I think, like, from my perspective, it looks like we did a really great job, and Andrea as well, who jumped in answering all the questions that came in. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Oh, thanks, so it Andrea. looks pretty good. I think what we can probably do now is go ahead and close this down, but I can leave it up for another five minutes. And if anyone does have any last questions or wants to save out any of the links that were chatted out, you can do that in that time. And yeah. then, as I said before, if you find after you have questions you wish you asked, you can find us uh, in the community or on live chat. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, again, um... Thanks everyone for, um, oops, that's a wonderful slide, that one. Thank you, that's the slide <laughs> I wanted. No worries, I'm gonna take over the slides anyway and Okay, hide them, thank you, but... Stephanie. Thank you for keeping this organized. <laughs> I got you. Fantastic. No.
Awesome. Thank you, Mark and Kaylin. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and kind of close this down in the next five minutes. Bye, folks. Bye.